Brothers and sisters, in Jesus Christ, our gospel is from the book of St. Matthew, chapter 5. We pick up the Sermon on the Mount with verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its flavor, how will it become salty again? Then it is no good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on by people. You are the light of the world. A city located on a hill cannot be hidden. People do not light a lamp and put it under a basket. No, they put it on a stand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. In the same way, let your light shine in people's presence so that they may see your good deeds, your good works, and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy them, but to fulfill them. Amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not even the smallest letter or even part of a letter will in any way pass away from the law until everything is fulfilled. So whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Indeed, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and experts in the law, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The gospel of our Lord. Friends in Christ, grace and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Who do you think you are? Have you ever been asked that question, who do you think you are? Do you think that you are very important or not so much? Do you think that you're the kind of person people come to, people gravitate to because of your excellent character? Or maybe the kind of person who repels other people kind of sends them walking away wondering what's, what's wrong with her? What's the deal with that guy? Are you the popular person at school? Are you the person that everyone kind of sees as famous, walking around the halls? Maybe you have a sport that everyone knows you by or, or a skill or an ability? Or you're kind of the lonely person who gets lost in a crowd and that everyone seems to pick on or just not even notice at all. Who do you think you are? Are you the kind of person who feels deeply or really hurts just to find some kind of feeling in life? Are you a person characterized by what you do? Or are you a person who gets by on your good name or maybe is not considered because of your bad name? It's an important question, isn't it? Um, Because God is interested in telling us who we are. Jesus is interested in explaining that, unpacking that for us today. Who does Jesus think you are? That's a question worth considering, worth thinking about every single day. Is how Jesus perceives you, what he thinks about you and how that impacts your life. He tells us. He tells us what he thinks about us. He thinks you are different. He says you are the light of the world. Now it's true that when he spoke this, he was speaking to the apostles. He was telling them they were the light of the world because they were to carry out all of God's mission work in the world to come, and even now, preachers today are doing the very same thing, carrying out the mission work of God and Jesus Christ. But to the Philippians, to the common member at the church in Philippi, Paul writes that they're to shine as lights in the world. They're to be lights. And so our text says, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works. So what's that all about? Now, In order for a Christian to let light shine, a Christian has to have light. 
So these words aren't really addressed to people who have no faith, to people who do not believe in Jesus Christ without the light. If you're still in darkness, your first care has to be to find that light and to seek that light. So what is the light? Now, a lot of people would consider like a period after the medieval times, like the Enlightenment, that must be the light. Maybe education, maybe science, maybe learning. And it's true, we we certainly live in an age where literacy is just off the charts. There's a lot of smart people in the world. And yet, there's still very many souls, educated ones, that are still in darkness and people who still are trapped and caught in their sins. And meanwhile, there is many uneducated people who put their hope and all of their trust in the light that is in the Bible. And because of that, they have rest and release and a life that's unburdened by faith alone. In John 8, verse 12, Jesus says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Jesus Christ himself is the one true light. If you would like to have this light, he invites you to him, he wants you to seek him, he wants you to come to him and embrace his light. He wants you to find deep wisdom in him and in him alone. He wants you to find an answer and a correction to your problems in him and in him alone. He wants to be your righteousness to be the atonement for your sins and your forgiveness always. He wants to be your heaven, and he wants to provide heaven for you. He loves you just that much, no matter how much darkness there is that enshrouds you. Are you in darkness? Do you know where your soul would land if you were to die today? Would you be in trouble with a perfect God? Have you discovered that your righteousness does not surpass that of the wisest and best, the Pharisees of old? Have you discovered that, yes, you have broken the least of the commandments of God, to say the least? In many cases, we've broken the biggest commandments of God. So Jesus says, seek this light. Come forth out of darkness. If you sleep, awake and arise from the dead because Christ will give you light. He won't leave you alone in darkness. He's not going to abandon you to the grave. He wants to enlighten your eyes so that you can see this precious gift, the light of your soul. And now those who have the light are commanded in our text, let your light shine before men. So there's more to the story. Jesus says, first of all, come, I invite you to the light. But now that you have the light, guess what? You can't be a Christian in secret. That's not how it works. If you believed in Jesus so that you could only believe in him in the darkest of corners or in the times when no one's looking, you've got a wrong idea of what Christianity is. God tells us to be the light of the world, that just like a city on a hill can't be hidden, a city on a hill would be quite vulnerable. They didn't have a whole lot of those back in the days of Jesus' time. Jerusalem was one of them that was on a hill. Maybe you could imagine a city on a hill. In the same way that people can see a city plain on a hill, beaming with light, so that's how Christians ought to look to the rest of the world. In fact, we could say it even more strongly. It's not just that you should look like a light, but whether you like it or not, because you call yourself a Christian, you are a light. And you might wonder what that means. What do people see when they see you? It does put us in a very vulnerable position. Um, A position to say, I believe, therefore I speak. But not only that, it also says, I believe, therefore I act. Because a confession with the mouth is only part of the story. Here the Lord is speaking of a confession of works. Because he adds, so that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. Now, later on in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is going to say, 
Um, Don't be ostentatious about your works. The point isn't that we publicize our good works and we put a plaque on every good work that we do so that other people can see it. And the point isn't that we're advertising ourselves. But whether you're publicizing it or not, a Christian does good works. That's what we do. And, And we do them maybe in secret, but we also do them out in the open. And the works that we do, people are watching whether they are good or wicked. And people can see a lot from the way you behave and not just what you speak. What is the old saying? That actions speak louder than words. Many times that's true. So Jesus challenges us. Are you saying everything just so and just right, but then when you leave church or when you leave a public place, where is your heart? Are you still a light? Are you something where people gravitate to you, a beacon of who Christ is and his forgiveness, his goodness, his honesty, his humility? Or are you behaving like a creature of the darkness? And who cares who see? Because it's between me and God. And it's funny how so often when people say, only God can judge us, they go on and do things that God has certainly placed judgment on. God does judge to say God, only God can judge us doesn't mean that we can escape God's judgment just by escaping the others. Um, so it was true back in Jesus' time. There were actually many chief rulers who put their faith in Jesus, who wanted to trust him, who wanted him to be their light. But guess what? Because of the Pharisees, because they didn't want to be put out of the synagogue, they chose either to meet with him in secret or to give up really following him at all. They'd listen to his words, but they wouldn't follow through in their actions and in their deeds. And so they proved that they loved the praise of men rather than the praise of God. Another challenge. Do we love what people will say about us more than we love what God has to say about us? So the very simple meaning of our text is that those who have the light should walk as children of light, to resist the works of darkness, to follow what is good, to walk away from the sinful nature, to drown it in the promises of your baptism, to step with the Spirit, to battle on, even when there are obstacles in this battle, to be a light not of ourselves or the darkness, um, but to be a light of Christ to do good works as we have opportunity, whether people are watching or not, whether hidden or out in the open or not. And you don't need to make a whole lot of noise. If you are following in the light of Christ, people are going to notice. Soon enough, they'll see. People are going to test your Savior by who you are. Because the important part here is that when when people see you do good works, they realize that this Christianity you believe in, it's not just a theory. It's it's not just an idea. And it's not just a suggestion or a hint of hope that may possibly be. Instead, they see what you walk and live your life by this light. It changes how you think. It changes not only what you believe, but what you do. It changes how you handle your money your wallet. It changes you when you're alone and guided into prayer. And in that way, your light shines. There must be something to this Christ. There must be something to this Christianity. The Lord urges us to shoulder up to the task, to earnestly take to heart how necessary it is to let our light shine before men. Because um, it's true that it's evil to do wicked things. But it's also sinful to not do what is right. And so this text offers us three strong argument, arguments for being diligent about good works. It's going to occupy the rest of our sermon. Three strong arguments for being diligent about good works. The first one is to put into practice what is good. That means studying God's word and living your life by it. This is what Paul says to the Philippians again. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. 
Jesus says in Luke 12, the servant who knows the master's will and doesn't do it is beaten with many blows. Just like that, the, the scriptures cut off from the kingdom of heaven people who would not just do evil works, but leave good works undone. Not just sins of commission, but sins of omission. So hear the command of the Lord your God and do good. It's the command of the one who gave you body and soul. The command of the one who said, let there be light. The command of the one who purchased your life with his own blood. The command of your Savior, Jesus Christ. Let your light shine. The second argument is um, that you are a child of the light, and it's in the nature of light that it will shine. If a light doesn't shine, then by definition, it's not a light. And if a light is dimming and snuffed out, it's no longer there. Do you have the light of Christ? If you have the light of Christ, then follow these words of Paul. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, proving what is right in the Lord. We're made Christians without our good works, and it's the Holy Spirit who creates Christianity in our hearts, who creates faith in our hearts, so that it's not the first step towards God that's our responsibility. We have no power to do that. But the Bible makes it very clear that our second step of sanctification is now something we agree with, It's something we cooperate in. It's actually something that we want. It's something that we desire because of the new creation God's made in our heart, because of the Holy Spirit. In fact, Paul says emphatically, not only that this is what you're supposed to do, but that these works were prepared in advance for you to do it. The good works that you're going to do today and this week, they were foreordained. They were prepared before time began, just alongside your salvation. So don't say it in your heart that it's okay to do wrong. Don't give yourself excuses because you have a God behind you who shows you how to battle the devil and do good works that he's ordained in advance for you to do. And the brighter the light, the brighter it will shine. The third uh, main point is actually the main point of our good works. We Christians are supposed to walk in them in order to commend the gospel to those around us. We should walk so that if people see us, if they see the way that we walk, they would have to conclude that Jesus Christ isn't just some name on a page, but that this is a name of power, and that this is a name that we love and has freed us from the depths of sin. Paul writes, again to the Philippians in chapter 2, that you may become blameless and pure, children of God, without fault, in a warped and crooked generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's right. Shine lights in the world, so that you're wearing your faith out in the open, out on your sleeve, so that if someone sees you and sees how you behave and sees what shines forth, that person will say, Now that's a person of Bethlehem. That's someone who's honest, humble, does what's right and good, is kind and generous. You might say, well, I'm not sure if I'm up to that task. That seems pretty daunting. And I think it's only right for a sinner to say that. That's right, we're not up to that task. Truly, it doesn't fit us sinners, but it fits the one who called you out of sin. It fits the one who has broken sin and the power of the devil. It fits the one who died on the cross for you. It fits the one who sent his spirit into your heart. He's promised it. He's faithful, and he will do it. Amen.